Welcome to We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only show dedicated to the process and strategies for transforming apartment buildings to thriving communities. I am your host, John Brackett, and welcome to the show. All right, folks, welcome to We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only place where you can come to learn how to take apartment buildings and turn them into amazing communities. So I am your host, John Brackett. I have here a special guest. His name is Jonathan Barr. Someone who is homegrown from the LA area, not too far from us, a neighbor, also a San Diego State Aztec, so that qualifies him for being naturally smart. (laughs) (laughs) So so I'm going to share your story, bud. So Jonathan really has an interesting uh, background because his parents started in this business and started flipping homes, building, developing, um, and in total, I think they have you know, flipped, built, developed over about 400 different projects. And this was up in the LA area, very competitive market, very unique market. And a lot of these were acquired in the foreclosure era, you know, up in LA. So he has a lot of really good experiences, um, especially touching real estate, right? I, I think that in this business, you know, when you have a really good background or foundation and understanding how a property is built ground up, it does give you an advantage when you're looking at deals and when you're transi- transitioning into commercial real estate, in this case, um, you know, apartment building. So uh, very happy to have you on the show, Jonathan. Really appreciate you being on. And uh, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me. So, how are you doing today? Yeah, you're very welcome. Very welcome. Yeah. Excited to have you. So I'm really excited to get into this because I know you've acquired some new assets out of state, right? Yep. Um, Mm -hmm. and so I also told you that I, I, uh, recently came back from Arizona. So you're actually looking into my home right now. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not in my office. All right. So, um, man, I have a lot of different questions and I really appreciate the conversation that you and I had before we we got on. It really helped me get a feel for what you've Mm -hmm. done in the past and where you're going in the future, right? Not only what you're doing now, but where you're trying to take your operation. So, Share your story, man, because I think it's going to be an important one for our audience to, you know, to, uh, to hear. How did you get started in this space? Yeah, so as you said, I'm born and raised in L.A., which is rare for people from L.A. to actually stay in L.A. Um, I'm, my, I'm a first-generation American. My, my mom's from Mexico. My dad's from Israel, so hablo español, which is very helpful in the real estate industry, yes, let yes, me tell yes. you. <laughs> um, so my my real estate journey starts uh, after the Great Recession. Graduated from San Diego State, as you said, in 2008. Um, couldn't find a job, and my mom was basically come work for her. I was reluctant to go work for my parents because you kind of want to be independent, and do your own thing, right? Right. Um, and so I I went. Also, kind of just had that sense of duty, you know, come come back, help your family, especially because they got hit pretty hard by the recession and and their real estate holdings and all that kind of stuff. So came back um, and we started to go to the trustee sales. Luckily, they had some connections to some investors that had capital and they had had some education with going to the trustee sales and courthouse steps from doing that in the past. And also luckily back then you could buy a house for like two, 300,000 in, in LA, which is pretty cheap. And so you didn't need as much capital as you do now because that same two, $300,000 home is now worth seven, 800 or, or more sometimes. Right. right. Um, and so I was doing everything I was doing, you know, all the valuations late into the night, looking at the properties in the morning uh, driving to the courthouse, actually bid on it. And then a lot of times going to the properties after the fact to knock on people's doors and tell them that we just bought the property and they had to leave. And that was, that was not, that, that part was not very fun. And I have some stories when it comes to that of just pretty, that, you know, that's not the pretty, the pretty side of things. And I mean, that's how real estate is. It's not always so pretty. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, so we I did that for probably 10, 11 years, was involved in 400 projects, anything from a trendy flip to ground up to development where we developed six to 12 unit townhouse style homes. 
Um, and then during that kind of like after recession period, I bought a few duplexes that I held for 10 or so years that appreciated about 400%. I've been selling them in the last few years and now buying uh, apartments out of state. Bought my first one in November of last year in Kansas City, just a smaller uh, apartment that I bought with my own funds. And then the property in Oklahoma City, we just bought that just over a month ago and that we bought with property that we sold in LA and, and a couple of other investors. Okay, awesome, awesome. So um, My brother okay. and I now started this business to... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Jonathan, yeah. so I have a couple of questions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry. I was rambling. <laughs> oh no, man. It's great. It's great. There was just, there was a lot in there. So I'm going to unpack some of that for our audience. Okay. There, 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 are, there are a lot of nuggets in there. And so I'm going to unpack some of that stuff. So I heard a lot of different things, but one of the things that stood out to me was you said you're up late in the night valuing properties. In this case, you know, you guys acquired over 400 properties, right? So you spent a lot of time on the valuation side. It sounds like you worked your way through many different facets of the yeah. cycle of an investment, right? From acquisition to disposition. So yep. what was the greatest lesson learned okay, going through those 400 acquisitions and everything in between? Well, that's a good question. Um, um, I think... <laughs> Oh, just like mental fortitude, you know, like this, this business, a lot of times you're kind of eating shit most of the time. And there's, you know, like the deals are far, far and far between or, you know, yeah. and so just being able to be patient and realize that, that good things are coming. And then when it does happen, it, it makes it all worth it. But I, I think a lot of times people portray this business as kind of flashy and you're going to make all this money and, and all this stuff, but it's, it's hard work and there's going to be ups and downs. And hopefully from the downs, you learn a lot and they make you stronger for the next things. And I've had, I've had experiences where we've lost money and we've had other experiences where we've made way more money than we ever thought we could have made on the deal. Right. Sure. And that makes it worth it. It makes up for some of the stuff that didn't go the way it, the way it should have. And also I think another important part is uh, picking the right partners because I've had a couple deals that didn't go so well. And like the person, you know, you see people's true colors when, when bad stuff happens. And so that's why picking the right partners is very important because you, you, you need to know that they're there for you when, when shit happens, you know? Okay. Awesome, man. And I, really, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I have this saying, right? And this saying is based on my own personal experiences. There are two things that will always show someone's true character, okay? And this has proven to be true for me every single time. And I've been doing this for a while now. And the first thing is pressure or stress, right? If you really want to understand someone's true character, man, you put them under a lot of stress. Or watch how they perform under a lot of stress. And typically... What happens as they go throughout that process is who that person really is. And it's, it, for me, that has been true nine out of 10 times. Okay, that's the first thing. Okay, the second thing is money. How money changes people, either when you lose a lot of it. Oh my gosh. Or you make Tell a lot me. of it, right? <laughs> you lose a lot of it or you make a lot of it. Those two scenarios, man, will help you really understand how someone's character is. So for me, I've come to learn that when I look for, for people to work with, especially when there's money involved, those two things are really, really important. I want to understand, understand how do you perform under pressure, okay? And then what does your character look like, right? When you've lost a lot of money, if you have, or the flip side of that is, you know, as you have made a lot of money or, or you are making money now, right? Those two things have been, have been proven to be really true for me. So when you made the comment of, you know, understanding your partners and who they really are, uh, that is huge. And I really appreciate you sharing that. So I'm going to, I'm going to, and cause so those are huge lessons. I think those are really, really big, right? So a couple other things that I want to ask you. So one of the things that you said that really caught my ear, which I thought man was really, really cool, right? Because you just came out and said it and it's the truth. This business is not always flash and cash. <laughs> in yeah. fact, in many cases, it's the opposite, right? Yeah. You have to start off doing the things that most people simply are unwilling to do. Okay, 
And doing those things consist- consistently over time will eventually allow you to build a portfolio where you can put yourself in a position, okay, to then step back, right, and now start putting people in place and managing people and then, you know, gradually building your portfolio yep. and, of course, building your empire, right? So one of the things that you mentioned that really stood out was you said, hey, man, I was at a, at a point where when we're doing these 400 flips, okay, I was doing cash for keys. I was going out, meeting with people that were occupying the property to tell them that they don't own this house anymore. And it wasn't – obviously, you're going to get a lot of contention from, from those experiences, yep. right? Yep. So share with us your most – challenging story going through that process and how did you solve that problem? Okay. Or how did you make that an amicable situation to move through it? Right. Because, you know, very difficult situation. You have to take a property back, no longer belongs to the person that's occupying the property. Okay. But yet they're in there and they need a place to stay. You have a lot of emotions going on. Okay. You're there to do a job right? They're in a position where, man, they're getting ready to lose their home. There's a lot of emotion at stake. So talk a little bit about that. Some of your experiences doing that. Okay. So one particular experience. Let me just, let me just just say this. Okay. Just to take, just to diffuse this so that from the viewpoint of our audience, um, we look at this more from a learning experience and not get emotionally tied into it, right? So I'm going to preface this by saying it's not good or bad. It's just, it just is. And so we're you're sharing with us your experience, right, where there's no judgment, okay? So go ahead. Well, I'll share two things. I'll, I'll share one experience that was positive and one that was negative, just Let's so you can have two stories to c- compare to. I love it. Um, so the first story, um, it was a small house that we bought. We went over there, and the, the owner was – was super cool about it, like knew that he lost the property. And he's like, just give me a week. And we're like, of course, you could have a week, like no problem. That's easy. Right. And so we can't come back a week later. And he left the place completely clean. He even cleaned it for us. Everything was like spick and span. Like we didn't even give him money to move out because most of these people we are giving them, you know, three, four, five thousand, sometimes more money to move out of these places. Right. Um, and so we actually, we sent him a thousand dollars in the mail to his new address. Cause we were just like, this is amazing. Like no one does this for us. And he called us back. He's like, I think you guys accidentally sent me a check or something. We're like, no, that's just a thank you for like being so cool. Like th- that's awesome. He's like, really? Okay. And so that, that was a really amazing story and that was pretty rare. And then on the flip side of that coin, I had, a situation where we bought a property at the auctions and the guy was just like super aggressive. And I was talking to him the whole time. And he, he, it got to a point where he was calling me in the middle of the night to cuss me out. Um, Things were getting crazy. Um, I was in his, we went to his, I was out his front yard and then he, cause they were finally starting to move out and he drove the U-Haul onto the lawn and kind of like looked like he was going to try to hit me, but he stopped luckily. But so eventually we did get him to move out because, you know, he didn't want to go through the whole court process and get the sheriff out there and do that whole sure, thing. Sure. But like, I, I, I bring up both those stories because I've had it from people like I bring up both those stories because you kind of have both people. You have some people that are just like, you know what, like this happened, this sucks. I got to move on and they're cool with it. And then you have the other people that are, I, I guess you could call them psychopaths, but. <laughs> well, uh, but, but here's the thing that that's just the reality of the world that we live in, right? Whether it's yeah. real estate, right. You're an employee for another company. You work in a fortune 500 company. You're, you're dealing with different personalities and there's always going to be a paradox, right? There's going to be, um, a conversation that you're going to have that's going to go really smooth. And in many cases, you're going to have a conversation that doesn't go as smooth as planned, but ultimately you still have to get to the finish line. So what were some of the interpersonal communication skills that you feel that you picked up or maybe some of the, the talents that, that, that these kind of interactions help you develop or skill sets that these kind of interactions help you develop to now allow you to transition into buying apartment buildings, which we're going to talk about next. Yeah. Um, 
I think uh, like the whole like mental fortitude thing has been really important. And then also, um, and the patience thing again, but kind of that you don't fight with people that are irrational or that are not kind of thinking you kind of have to, you kind of have to let them do what they're going to do. I mean, you got to stand up for yourself and you got to, you got to do what's right for yourself, but it, it's not worth for fighting certain people on certain things. You let them have their way on certain things and important stuff. Obviously you have to stand up for it and push along the way, but something, some fights are not worth it and picking the right fights and knowing when to push and when not to push. Hey, I, I, like that. I like that. I like that's, that. That's what I've learned from that. Okay, great. So we're going to transition now into some of the apartment buildings that you purchased. Okay. Okay. Um, so you shared with me earlier that, you know, you've recently acquired two apartment buildings. These are your first two acquisitions. One, one was a 14 unit or was it a 14 or 16? 14. Okay. 14 unit apartment building in Oklahoma Kansas City. City. Kansas, Kansas City. Kansas City. Yep. And then the other one was in Oklahoma. Okay. So yeah. share with us why the first acquisition in Kansas City. What was the thought process behind that? What motivated you to make that purchase out of state in that specific market? Yeah. So my wife actually has family in Kansas City. So that what that's what originally got me interested in Kansas City because I was bored one Christmas while we were there. And, and of course, I was looking at buildings in the area to see if it kind of made sense. And like back of the napkin, I was like, huh. This this could probably actually work, right? right. Um, and so then I reached out to brokers, did property tours, and started looking at the numbers. and And what happened was I was looking at my duplexes that I had in LA, and I was looking at the equity that I actually had on the property. And I was looking at what what's my actual re- return on that equity, not on the actual cash I put on, in it, but the actual e- return on that equity. And it was like three percent. And if I moved it to Kansas City, I would have pretty much tripled that. And that was buying a turnkey property because that first property was a turnkey property because I was busy in the flip business at the time. Um, So I was just like, let me just move it over here and test this out basically and, and make sure I have a good team that can manage it well. And so far it's going really well. It's performing probably 10 to 15% better than I perform at it. So, okay, cool. So so good. Let's talk through that. All right. Let's yeah. talk to you. So we're going to talk through the cycle of that 14, that 14 unit acquisition. So we're going to talk about, you know, how you underwrote that really, just really briefly, you know, yeah. how you financed it. And of course, how you, man- how you manage that. Yep. So you, you kind of talk really brief, briefly about the back of the napkin underwriting. Okay. And I do that all the time. All right. Yeah. But when you actually decided that, Hey, I think this could potentially work. What did the ratios look like? What did your numbers look like to make you get serious about that deal and then pull the trigger on it? Yeah, so I like I said, I was getting about three to four percent return on the equity on the property I sold, and on this property now I'm getting about twelve percent cash on cash return, about a thirteen fourteen percent IRR, um, and I didn't really have to do anything. Like in LA, if I would have. I I probably could have done something similar in LA, but I would have had to move like 10 tenants in a rent control area and gutted the place. So a lot of brain damage for the same return. Okay, cool. So you said, (laughs) what was the internal rate of return on the acquisition on the 14? Um, It was about, about 13 to 14%. Okay. And then what what portion of that was, was return was cash made up your return on cash. Um, uh, my cash on cash return on that right it, it's about 11 12 percent cash on cash okay so you're over a 10 year span okay so your 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 cash return let me make sure i'm, I'm seeing this correctly okay or i'm asking the right question so your your return on ca- okay so your internal rate of return was 13 percent over what period was it a five-year period 10-year period 10-year period okay 10 years okay and then your your yield your cat your your you yield on your investment, right? Or your yeah, cash. It's about eleven percent or so. Um, that's because it's a ten-year loan, uh, three years IO, so that kind of helped on that side of things. It's a CMBS loan. It was my first kind of like commercial type loan of uh, over a million dollars. 
And this was on the 14 unit. That's correct. Okay, cool. Okay, awesome, man. I appreciate you sharing that. Okay, so now we're going to get into the financing side of that, which you already kind of touched yeah, on. Yeah, I kind of just said yeah. it. <laughs> so talk about that loan, though. Talk about that loan, right? It was your first CMBS yeah. loan. Talk about who the lender was. You know, what yeah, the- so it was a CMBS loan with uh, – who's the lender? Uh, I don't recall the, re- the actual lender right now. Uh, Sabal Capital. Was it? Them. I'm sorry? Sabal Capital. Oh, Sabal. They're okay. actually in, in Irvine. Okay believe it or not. Um, so it was really challenging actually to get that loan because I didn't at the time have specifically uh, experience with over four units. Right. So they, they put me through the ringer. I had to show them like all, I gave them a list of like four, all the 400 deals and like where all the addresses, when I bought them, how much we bought them for, what were they, all that. And I had a, and like the developments and I even, I even, my dad has a, an apartment in LA that he manages and I just told him I helped him and he kind of like vouched for me too, just to, <laughs> to like get it through because it was, it was kind of ridiculous what they put me through to make this, this deal go through, but we got it through and, and then, and yeah, and we had, yeah, so it was fun. And then like the whole experience with the attorneys and, and drafting all the documents and all that it was, it was, it was quite the experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it sounds that way. So what, you, what was your biggest takeaway from that? Um, I think, well, I, like not all lenders and banks and different loan products are, are alike. Cause on the, on the next deal, um, it was a bank loan and it was just so much easier, much less reports, a lot less questions. They, they didn't even bring up the, they didn't even bring up anything about experience on that one. And I mean, I gave them my history, but they were, I guess they were okay with that. Right. Right. Okay. And so that was the, that's when you, you, you purchased up, right? You did it, did a, a tender run exchange into the building that's behind you, which is, was it, yep. was it 72 units or 75? 72. Okay, cool. So talk a little bit about that. Okay. So walk us through the cycle of that acquisition from we're talking about the acquisition first, how you underwrote that deal, what the numbers look like, what made you pull the trigger on it. Then we're going to move into financing it, right? How you structure that debt and equity, what yep. interest rate was, who the players were in there. And yep. then property management is going to be a big one because that's out of state. And yep. you know, we'll talk about some of the lessons learned there. So yep. uh, start us off, man, with the acquisition. Yeah. So my brother, who's my partner, contacted the property manager that's also owner operator in the area. And he kind of knew about this deal. And then separately, my brother contacted the broker that control over the deal. And so the property manager kind of vouched for us with that broker so that, um, so that kind of gave us credibility because she didn't want she, the seller wanted to work with someone that they knew that could close and they've done a deal with before, but she had done a deal with, with the property manager before. So the fact that he vouched for us because he believed in us and our story um, kind of gave us that credibility with the broker. So that's kind of how that deal was put together. And so the numbers, it's about a 10% cash on cash return and a 16% IRR over a seven year period. And, and the property manager is actually out of Denver, but he has with, with this property now about a thousand units under ownership management and has two complexes around the corner. And that's kind of the, the value add play here we're, we change management we're reducing expenses by 25 percent, and we're doing that by cutting down huge on the marketing costs and sharing some payroll costs because there's two other complexes around the corner from this property that this manager manages as well so we could bounce maintenance people we could bounce leasing people all that kind of stuff and it's reduced it incredibly and we're not pushing rents too much because of covid and we're putting vacancies up. And even with, with all that, we're able to, to get pretty good returns. And that's mainly because we're able to add an extra unit. It was like a storage unit that we're turning back into a studio unit. And we got a really low rate at two and a half percent from this bank, uh, bank of the West. So, So let's talk a little bit about the business plan, right? So your comment was, Hey, we've been able to, one of the reasons why this deal we thought was so great was we felt we can reduce 
operating expenses by 25%, which in this business is really huge, right? Yeah. You hit those targets. I mean, that's a huge. It's 112,000 in the first year. Yeah. It's a huge, (laughs) huge, um, you know, improvement, right? So let's, let's unpack that a little bit. Let's kind of dissect those expenses Yep. And, and why you were able to do that. So I understand the logic behind sharing payroll costs, right? If you're spreading your payroll costs amongst, so this is a 75 unit and you have two other properties there. Now you have three properties sharing, you know, it's sharing the same payroll, right? That's a, that's a really good benefit. Okay. Is that what I heard you say? You're, you're sharing payroll. Yep. Okay. And so what are the, yeah, we're sharing. What are, what are the, um, what, what is the labor mix that you're actually sharing, right? So is it, is it one property manager, a, a maintenance tech, a porter? Yeah, talk I about- mean, we're, we're basically able to just have one property manager and a maintenance tech, and we're able to get away with that because they have a regional and they have a floating assistant that I think we're actually not paying for that. I think they just kind of baked it into their property management fee. Um. And, and then we're also reducing on marketing costs. They had like 50, 60,000 in marketing t- costs. That was unnecessary through all these like different like websites and monitoring reviews and all this stuff that's unnecessary. And we basically lowered that down to $300 a month for an apartments.com um, website. And right now we're actually not using apartments.com because we haven't needed it. We've just been doing like Craigslist ad ads and stuff like that and and posting through the yardy system um and then insurance we brought down a little bit and then also they had a bunch of turns and right now we're we're basically 98 percent occupied and we're gonna have a lot less turns because they basically almost turned the whole building last year because the manager just wasn't doing a good job previously so was this building do you know the history of the building that you purchased, right? Who, who was man, who owned it prior to you? Were they, um, they're, they're actually a big firm out of New York that owns like 30,000 units all over the country. Um, and these are their, they sold this one and another property at the same time. And actually our, our property manager uh, bought that property as kind of like a package deal with us. And that's kind of part of the way that the deal happened. Um, and I think they just, I don't even know if they ever went to the property, to be honest. Like they just were very hands off and ha- went through a few property management companies. And I think that's the difference with us is we're, we're on the phone with them once a week. There's probably an email between us and our PM every single day. Like we are, we are on top of them without what, I mean, hopefully we're not bothering them too much, but we're, we're definitely like on them. And right now it's the beginning too. So we have a few projects going on and we're kind of feeling out how to work together and all that kind of stuff. So, but like tracking the KPIs, tracking all, like everything we could track to make sure it's going in the, in the right direction. So what, what do you think was maybe um, for the audience out there, when you look back on this purchase for the 75 unit, if you could do it over again, what would you have done differently? I don't know right now, honestly. That's okay. cool. and, and that's okay. That, that's, a, that's an honest <laughs> answer, right? Because it, it, it's a new acquisition. So you're still trying to hit your, you're still trying to execute on your business plan. Yeah. But it sounds like from what we discussed that you're a little bit ahead of your projections, which is usually a, a, a good thing. Yeah. As long as, as, long as ask uh, me that question in a year and then okay, I'll probably have a better answer. Yeah. I'm going to ask yeah. you that question in a year. I'm going to, I'm going to call you. And I'm known to do this. I'll call you out of the blue and say, hey, man, Jonathan, remember when we talked about this? How did that go? <laughs> what did you learn? What did you learn? Okay. okay. So, hey, man, I really appreciate being on. We're, we're kind of winding down, right? We're coming yeah. to the end of the show. Yeah. But I think one thing that would be really cool to share with our audience is when we talked about interest rate, you know, Bank of the West was involved in this, of course. And uh, you mentioned that they had a derivative, that, that they presented a derivative, derivative product, right, that you've been able to leverage. So can you talk about that a little bit? Um, because uh, I think that was pretty, it was, it was pretty interesting how you were able to leverage that. Um, but also the fact that that's tied to LIBOR. I, I know there are some things going on with LIBOR right now, but talk about that a little bit. 
Yeah, so we we really get a really good rate, two and a half percent on. You usually don't see those kinds of rates on like a two million plus loan. You, you, I've heard of it in like that like over six million range. I've heard of it so far, but so they had a promotion where we deposited twenty five percent of the loan amount at the bank. So we're able to put like our capex and our reserves, and then and then some other funds that we had at that bank but we didn't, we don't have to keep it there we could take it out now if we wanted to so it's not like a reserve um but and then and because of that we were able to get a loan from 3.3 to two and a half percent so it's it amounts to about twelve hundred dollars in our pocket more every single month just by that difference um Okay. And so that's huge. I mean, there is one downside that if LIBOR does go into the negative, we could own, if we refi in year three or, or sell in year three, we could owe a prepayment, but it could also go the other way. If it goes above, I think it was like a 0.55 of the LIBOR, um, they'll actually pay, give us a credit at the refi or sale um, in this, in the same amount. So th- there's some risk there, or we wait till year five where the, where, sw- where the swap will go away and we have to, we won't owe or get paid anything. And we just need to refi and sell at that point. Okay. So so it, the, yeah. The base rate that they used was LIBOR though, right? Yep. LIBOR. And then they have a spread and then there's like yep. some other mechanism that they calculate it. Okay, and so your LIBOR then is what, maybe 50 basis points, a little bit? Yep. 50 basis points? Yeah, Yeah, and then there's about a 2% spread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 200 basis points for a 2% spread. Okay, so if LIBOR drops, the goes negative on you, right, which would be a 51 basis point drop, then you then start- It would have to go pretty far negative for us to be in- What's that? It, yeah. So it would have to go negative for you to start then actually accruing um, a cost. If we sold or refi, but that's never happened in the history of the country. So I think odds are on our side, but you never know. Okay. So what, <laughs> happens if, what happens if LIBOR gets disbanded? Uh, I, I didn't ask that. I know. I didn't you, know, ask that. You, know, you know, that's, that's on the table, right? LIBOR is going away. Is it? Yeah, so you might want to call up and ask. The, the SoFi thing? Are you, are you talking about that? No, no, I'm talking about LIBOR. Just call them and say, hey, so what happens if LIBOR goes away? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't know either. I'm just really, yeah. <laughs> I'm just really curious if that counts as a negative. <laughs> if that I don't counts know. as a negative. That's a good yeah, we question. Don't, we don't know. We don't know. But I think that's one of the, the, the advantages of, of networking is just being able to ask these questions, right? But I'm really curious. I, I think that Swap product is a great product. And I know Bank of the West, they're heavily involved yeah. in that. And then they also have a secondary market group where they're selling loans off of the secondary market. And I'm sure that Swap product makes it more liquid for them to do that. But yeah, I think they're, they're able to like not – have to show it on their balance sheet or this something along those lines. I don't know exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They, they just sell it off. They sell it off to a secondary market. Yeah. Interesting. Right? Yeah. Is it a 30 year am- Is the product amortized? 30 year M. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, okay. You know, uh, Jonathan, I really appreciate you having you on. This has been really a great conversation and um, man, it, it's really great to see how you've been able to gain all the experiences that you have working with your parents. Right. And then, uh, being involved in over 400 projects, there's just a lot there that you learn that I think wow. yeah. a lot of people, like, a lot there that you learn that gets undervalued, right? Because inside of those 400 units, you have all these different experiences that range from learning about how to value a property, learning how to acquire, learning how to finance, learning how to deal with people is a really big one. To still be able to move your project to the finish line or to create the outcomes that you're looking for. And that a lot of that is about people, right? Really, like if you if you um, unveil the property, a lot of those opportunities come down to your ability to deal with people. And so there's just a lot of experiences that you've gained along the way. So I'm going to highlight a couple of things that you shared. Right? Is the first thing is mental fortitude. 
you mentioned that that was the biggest, if you could pull one thing away, your comment was, hey, mental fortitude would be the biggest one because this, this business is not always about um, uh, rainbows and unicorns, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> no, like, it's not. Hey, life is <laughs> sometimes not it is. Sometimes it is. But sometimes it is. Yeah. But the times that it is, if you really think about it, it's because you've been able to position yourself for those moments, right? Based on yep. everything that has happened up to that place. So I appreciate you sharing that. The second thing was, you know, you mentioned that you, you had a couple of partnerships that didn't go as bad. And one of the comments that you made is, hey, when things didn't go as great, um, the partner that I thought I knew wasn't really the person that I, that I, that I thought I knew, right? So the comment there was, know who you're working with, right? Or know the people that you do business with, really get to know them. Um, and then, you know, thirdly, yeah, it's a marriage. It, it is a marriage. A partnership is a marriage, man, which is why I think it's, it's extremely yeah. important before you, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, jump in bed with them to really make sure you understand right who they are. So I, I think that that was a yep. great insight shared. And then I, the, the, the big take, the other takeaway was that you shared was, um, and you, you used that with a story of, an experience where you're moving someone out of a home, a challenging one, and then a positive experience. But the big takeaway there was um, the fact that in every single environment, you're going to have to learn how to deal with people, right? And your ability to learn how to work with people will help improve uh, the outcomes. Challenging outcome. people. <laughs> yeah, especially challenging people. Will help improve yeah. the outcomes that you're trying to achieve whether it be in this business or your life for that matter. So uh, for that, man, I really appreciate you sharing that. This has been a really great show. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And so before, I, before you share how people can get a hold of you, one of the questions I always ask is, what is a question that you have for me that you think can add some value to our audience, if any? Um, so I think you've been talking to a lot of like syndicator types and would you say like a lot of them are come from a real estate background or do they come from different kinds of backgrounds or what's like primarily where, where are these people coming from? That's a really good question. I would say it's, it's 50, 50, 50% 50 of them come from real estate backgrounds, whether they start off as um, like what you did. Okay. Which yeah. is flipping homes. Uh, I started off that way as well. Right. Well, a little bit different. For me, it was commercial banking. Then I started, you know, flipping homes in 2008, 9, 10. And then same thing, building and developing. Um, and I see that pretty common. But 50% of them just have a real estate background in general. Okay, the other 50%, yeah. um, some exposure to real estate, but they weren't brought up in that business like you, right? I mean, you were literally brought up in that business. It's in my blood. <laughs> yeah, you're blood, man. You're brought up in that business. You're yeah. even though you may not realize it, right? That language was being ingrained in you since you're probably like ten years old. <laughs> so yeah, I I actually used to look at it too as like I I didn't deserve this because like I got a leg up that people uh, you know that people a lot of people have to figure it out on their own. But now looking back on it, I look at it more as an advantage because. I got to learn so much stuff faster that now I'm learning things that takes take some people another 10 years to learn, but I learned it that much quicker. Hey man, you know? I'm going to, I'm going to recommend a book to you. Okay. Um, it's called, it's a book by the name because of what you said. Okay? Yeah. That's a, that's a limitation on your ability to scale. And I'm going to point that out right now. Um, I don't remember the name of the book, but this is one of my, one of my favorite Oh gosh, books. Uh, the author's name is Gay Hendricks. Okay. okay. Guy's a professor at Stanford and he wrote this book. Uh, his name is Gay Hendricks. Give me a second. Let me, uh, I just shut off my phone so I can't pull it up. But um, it's a book around limiting beliefs, right? And he calls it upper limiting. So what you just said where you're like, hey, I, I didn't feel I wasn't worthy of being in this business. The point there being is, that kind of stuff restricts your ability to grow and take on big, bigger projects. Cause as long as you think you're not worthy of growing, guess what? 
You don't grow. I used to think that way. I got no, over no, that. No, no, I understand. I understand. <laughs> but check it out, man. It, it's a really cool, yeah. it's a really, really cool book. Um, but yeah, I, I, from what I've seen, it's 50-50, right? The, the mix is 50-50. Uh, do I think one group has a dominant advantage over the other? Uh, I really don't. I think this business really comes down to your willingness to just get out there and do it. And I've learned also over the years that learning is a skill. Okay. He who can learn, he who can learn the quickest and implement the smartest will typically advance the quickest and the furthest as long as they're consistently learning. That's why one group doesn't have an advantage yeah. over the other. But I think in the short term, if you're dealing with real estate and that's what you know and you have a good basis in that, it's going to give you an advantage in the short term. In the long term, man, he who learns and yeah. keeps learning is ultimately yep. going to go to And it's a people business at the end of the day, too. Yeah, it is a people business at the end of the day. Well, hey, man, I really appreciate the question. Tremendous question. Um, I also appreciate you for being on and sharing your insight, your wisdom. And I want to wish you continued success. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Jonathan, so how do people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about what you do? Yeah, just come to my website, JB, the number two investments with the S.com. Or you could also find me on Twitter. It's just the handle is JB2 Investments. And I'm pretty active on there. I post probably a couple times a week. So, hey, yeah. Awesome. yeah, thank you so much for sharing, buddy. Appreciate it. Clarity of Purpose creates our greatest competitive advantage. When we transform apartment buildings to thriving communities, we improve how people live and create assets with high profit margins. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this up with a friend. I'm John Brackett, bringing you things you can implement right away.